You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello and welcome to Garibaldi Red, Nottingham Forest podcast on Nottinghamshire Live. My name is Matt Davis, hosting as usual after another miserable chapter in a miserable season for Nottingham Forest thus far. A 2-1 defeat to Cardiff leaves Chris Hewton, well... He's been on the brink for a while, but ever more on the brink, you would imagine. Uh, Joined today to discuss the whole situation by Reds legend Gary Birtles, first of all. Gary, good morning. You well? Good morning. Yeah, good. Thanks, Matt. And also returning to the show is BT Sport and Beauty Radio 5 Lives, uh, Darren Fletcher. Fletch, good morning. Are you well? Yes, I am. I'm frustrated, but I'm well. Thank you. Good, good. Well, I uh, got my pre-match uh, gripes in about my personal life in before we started recording, so there's no point going over that because there's plenty yeah, of gripes. the away now, Matt. <laughs> There's plenty of guys to talk about when it comes to Forest. Um, so, uh, Gary, you and me both saw the game in full against Cardiff. What, what was your verdict? So it felt like a bit of a familiar story to me in terms of a really poor second half and they can't swing 90 minutes together. But, but how did you see it? It's same old, same old, isn't it? Uh, the, the, the overwhelming thing for me was looking at the two teams, the physicality of the two teams. Um I've said this before, not just about when Chris has been in charge, other managers, Forest don't look a very physical team. They look at times like, it's hard to describe, like school, like a, a schoolboy outfit sometimes. You, you look at Morrison at the back, uh, you, you look at the physicality of their players and we just don't look like a, a, a you know a physical team in that's able to compete with a lot of teams in that division at the moment. I mean, I felt sorry a little bit for Sambi yesterday because he was kicking the ball 60 yards at the pitch and you've got two strikers who can't head the ball or won't head the ball. It just kept coming back. And what else does he do apart from play from the back? I mean, I was six foot when I, you know, I'm, well, I'm still six foot. Cause I was going to say, you, yeah. <laughs> Not strong, well, yeah. say you shrink as you get older. Um, but, you know, I loved heading the ball, you know, and I, I was good in the air and it was my job to head the ball. But when it goes up front, you know, they're more interested in trying to foul or or not jump and head the ball. So it's coming back and the pressure's then intense on, on the back four all the time. So, you know, that was the overwhelming thing for me. And it's it's been the same over the past few seasons with, you know, s- several managers. We don't seem to buy players that are equipped to deal with the championship. Mm, yeah, I mean, before I come to you, Fletch, I'll, Gary's kind of led into the, the Kiefer Moore versus Lyle Taylor thing. I know you're a big fan of Kiefer Moore, Gaz, and... Well, we could have signed him, apparently. I mean, you know, we had the chance, by all accounts, I might be wrong. But look what he did when he came on. He holds the ball up. He'll head the ball. He'll cause havoc for defenders. You know, simple as. That's why I said about Lucas Zhao. Reading, you know, try and get him. If you can't get him, fine. But, you know, attempt it. Six foot five, 25 goals last season. You've got a target. You've got an outlet. Forrest, at the moment, haven't got an outlet because it keeps coming back. That's my problem. You know, strikers have got to hold the ball up. Strikers have got to head the ball. And we're not very good at doing either of those. Mm. When you hear that then, Fletch, it's kind of a Chris Hewton team, you expect it to be physically competitive. They're not passing teams off the park, even close to it. I mean, it's, when he was appointed a year ago, you, you said he was the perfect appointment. And I agreed. And, you know, I think all the Forest fans did. But the way it's turned out, I mean, it's such a sorry state of affairs, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would, I would put my hand up and say that I was, I was wrong in that regard because I thought we would see an impact from Chris. I thought we'd see an instant impact from Chris, and then I thought you'd see gradual progress. And and his track record as a manager would tell you that that would be the case. Um, I wouldn't say a managerial performance is ever bulletproof. But this looked to be a, a very good one at the outset by the, the owner. But I, I look at it and, and I don't see them any further on as a team now than they were the day he came. I, I don't really see progress. I don't really see too much of a, a pattern. I don't really see anything that gives you optimism that they're only a result or two away from it really kicking on. I, I, I just... They just look to me at the moment, having seen live two or three times this season, that they look a little bit of a team that's, that's almost caught in the fog, that I see other teams come and play them and they just seem to be more of a well-oiled unit. They just seem to be more comfortable in what they are. 
I mean, going back to the, the situation about the striker, I mean, Gary's just mentioned two there. I mean, you could rewind to the podcast that we did before the transfer window and, and everything really should have been centred around getting a, a striker because you look at Lewis Graben and you look at Lyle Taylor and with all due respect to the pair of them, you can't see them scoring enough goals, either individually or combined, over the course of this season to give Forrest something that's absolutely essential if you want to be successful in any division and that's a consistent source of gold. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm astonished that the main priority before they signed anybody else wasn't a centre forward of a significant standard that could make the team better. I was absolutely flabbergasted when the first transfer was a goalkeeper. And then I, I looked at it and it took so long to get to a position where they started signing players and still they didn't end up with a forward that makes the team significantly better. Yes, they got attacking players in, Zink and Argel, people like that, but they didn't get that central striker that you can build that team around. And I think it's going to cost them. I think that was the key area that they've got to get right this summer. I think they had to go and be bullish in the transfer market, might need to spend a couple of quid to get one. But I think if you want to make the transition from a, a middle of the road team to one that can have a push at the top six, you've got to have consistent goals, particularly in this division. History tells you that teams that get promoted have good strikers who score goals. But I just think from a Forest perspective, they also need that presence in both penalty boxes. They need somebody to play in and out of in the way that he wants to play. I mean, Gary's played the position. He knows how it works. And I look, I look at the team, guys, at the minute, and I think it would look so much different if they had a, a number nine that could play like a number nine and give them something that they clearly don't have. Mm. Well, I've been saying this, Matt, haven't I, on all the podcasts I've been doing. You looked at the stats and the stats for defending last season, we, we talked about it, third best in the league. So that wasn't a problem. The problem, as you just said, Fletch, has always been up front. So that should have been addressed time and time and time again. They should have done everything possible to get somebody who's going to get you near 20 goals. They got rid of a lot of players. So a lot of the money's gone off the wage bill there. But who's the recruitment down to? It doesn't sound like Chris has got a great deal of say in who comes and goes. And that creates a problem in itself. But at the moment, you're right. It, you don't see how, it, how we're going to win football matches. Chris said yesterday, we're losing it by the odd goal. Yeah, we are losing games by the odd goal, but we've got to start winning them by the odd goal. You, know, you go in front and how many times have we seen us lose those leads? And we've got to stop doing that. But I've got no confidence at the moment in up front scoring goals. I mean, we've got five points from the last 36. I mean, that is just dreadful when you, you put it into that perspective. And it's the worst start in 108 years. You know, that is not acceptable. I think every, I think maybe the club need to say, right, who is in charge of bringing players in? Because we don't seem to know. I think you've got to say about the owner, he keeps putting the money in. You know, through, we've said this before, through COVID, you know, there are no crowds in there. And he's kept putting his hand in his pocket. He's kept putting money in to that football club. And you've got to applaud him for that. But then people have got to take responsibility for the players coming in. And I think the players coming in, apart from the odd couple, have been particularly poor mm. all the way through. I've not been lifted. I've not had a smile put on my face by anybody in particular. Garner coming back, yes, you know, it's good to see him back. But apart from that, it's just been dreadful, to be quite honest. It's like the thing, Flats, kind of where the money's gone. I mean, you know, like, like Gaz says, Maranakis has put millions and millions in and it's been wasted. And now there's this cascading effect of you sign average or poor players and then it, it takes time to you know repair that damage. And now the, the budget's much smaller in a sense. So obviously COVID's a factor, but... You know, they've wasted so much money that now they're cutting their cloth accordingly. It's a kind of a cas cascading mess, isn't it? Yeah, what, 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 I, what I can't quite work out, and, I, and I, I'd, lo I'd love to be able to sit in on some of the meetings because the, the people that are choosing the players must be getting asked some serious questions by the fellow that's buying them because they buy lots of players every transfer window. You know, you look at transfer windows and you think well they're going to try and make the squad smaller in this one then but then they go and sign a, a handful I mean I, I don't quite know how it how it works it doesn't feel that joined up 
to me in terms of what the transfer strategy is. I'd love to know when he sits down and looks at the bottom line of the figures of the money that he's putting in and what he gets back, the kind of questions that he asks the people that, that make those decisions. Because with the kind of investment that he's made, this football team should be a lot better than it is. I'm not saying it should be a promotion team, but it shouldn't be a team that's cut adrift at the bottom of the championship, that's for sure. But again, I look at it and they seem to be trying to catch lightning in a bottle. The successful teams don't wait until the final 48 hours of the transfer window and then go and sign a handful of players. It just doesn't work that way. You identify a target, what you need, and you add that individual to your team, and then you build around that. And that it looked to, to me as though this summer needed to be that kind of strategy. Yeah, you get Garner back from Manchester United, superb. You know the centre-backs are OK. You know you're weak at full-back. Your goalkeeper's all right. And then the other thing that kind of gets me is that they seem to be caught between two methods. They're either going to try and do this through the academy or they're not. But at the minute, they seem to be between the two. That you've got a gaggle of players coming in where they've almost gone for the approach of, well, as long as we've got numbers, we'll work out the eleven. So they've got a lot of people. But then they've got one or two diamonds that have come through the academy that any team in the championship would love to have the opportunity to build a team around. Any team in the championship would love to have Brennan Johnson, Alex Myton, people like that. Forest have got them. But it worries me that they're going to get caught in the fog, that we're not going to maximise. We might have Brennan Johnson for one more season. He could be sold in, in January. This is the year where you think, right, let's really make this work. And I, I, I don't really see what it is. I don't see what it is. And, and you then sit there and, and when the substitutions are made, you know what the substitutions are going to be. You know, Brennan's going to go off or Alex is going to go off. You know, and then Zinc and Argo looks a good signing. There are, there are, th it's not, not all negative. You know, some of the players that have come in, you think, yeah, they're okay. Zinc and Argo, Garner, you know, they'll be all right. Low, the fullback will be all right. You know, it's fine. But I just, I just look at it and I, I'm not quite sure what it is i think you've either got to go young and go for the academy and do that and say look this might take two or three years and we're going to be brave enough to keep them so when somebody comes to buy johnson or buy mison we're not going to sell them for for two years we're going to give it a chance to grow and we're going to do it that way or you you, you carry on down the route they are which is just keep bringing in lots and lots of people and hoping that one way or the other you find an 11 that can be competitive but i i, I don't i don't see guys at the moment how this how it works, how it mixes. It just doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. I think the problem is you've got to mix things up a little bit. You can't say, right, we're, we're looking now for younger players to get us through because it's not fair on the two you mentioned, Brennan Johnson and Alex Mighton. It's not the pressure on those two because we all love watching them play is going to be intense because we're one point bottom of the league and people will be expecting those two players to make things happen. And that's a little bit unfair. You know, other players have got to, you know, step up to the plate a little bit. You know, I think I was enthused yesterday when I saw Taylor and Grabham were playing. So, yeah. yeah, Chris has gone, you know, he's gone positive. But I think second half, we only had the one shot on target, which was uh, Yates late on that decent strike. I think that's the only one possibly we had on target in the second half. Yeah, L Lolly had another long-range one, but they were very much reduced to long-range efforts, weren't they? There was no, no creativity. So, you know, so what is happening there? We've got two up front, but it was a bit disjointed. Uh, maybe the two of them because they've not played together before. But then you've got to look at the supply to those players. And I mentioned before, the, the, you know, they've got Morrison at the back and um, the other boy, what's his name? He's, he's scored Please. all the goals. Yeah. You can't play ball 60 yards at the pitch when you've got two six foot five centre halves who just head it for fun. You've got mm. to try and outthink them. You've got to play around them. You know, they, they would have loved it yesterday or just heading the ball non stop. And they're a massive threat in our box. You know, how many times should they have scored in the second half? You know, free headers. Yeah, I think their first goal was a bit lucky. It rebounded, you know, for the boy to stick it in. Uh, second, somebody should have closed him down before he got his shot in. People blame Samba again. Could he have done better? Maybe he could have stretched his arm a little bit more. But it's easy to blame a goalkeeper and it's easy to get, uh, blame a striker for missing an open goal. But you have to look at the, the bigger picture and... You know, the, the second goal, yes, it looked good, but you've got to close down quicker than that. You can't allow that to happen. It's the same as the Coventry game at the start of the season. Their players responded, 
you know, for the ball that bounced around the box, our defenders didn't. And then talking about Coventry, you look, I think they're in the top six, aren't they? Coventry at the moment. Mm. You know, you look at the, the budget they've probably got and other teams, we've mentioned Luton before, Barnsley, and that well, makes it Birmingham. even worse. Look at, look at Birmingham. Gary. Birmingham as well. Look yeah, Birmingham have gone from to where they are. And I watched them on Friday play um, play on the television. And, and Lee Bowyer had got a nice shape. He got round pegs in, in round holes. The Deeney effect was big on everybody. But the wing back on the left who scored, is it Bella? Yeah. It looked a good player. Won't it cost a, I mean, you just kind of look at it and you think they've they've managed to get themselves from nowhere to, you know, they'll be a mid-table team, you would think, this season because it's going to level off at some stage, but they've made progress. You know, I, I, I want to kind of go back to the striker, Gaz, because you, you you know way more about this than, than me or Matt, most of us who are, who are going to listen to this later. But when I look at the way that they've been playing in the main, and I know he played with two up top yesterday, when they play with a three behind one, the role of the, of, of the, of the one up top is massive. And I look at Taylor and I look at Graben and I wonder whether either of them are going to do what that number nine needs to do when you've got three behind, when you've got somebody playing as a 10 and you've got two wide off you. We see it work in the Premier League a lot. Manchester United played it at the weekend, played Ronaldo through the middle, they played Greenwood, they played Bruno Fernandes as the 10 and they played Sancho off the other side. But it's so important what the person does through the middle to make sure that the three behind can function. And when I see the team try and play that way, without Garner, I don't think they were ever getting the ball out quickly enough to the wide position, so the ball could never get there because they didn't have a passer. But then when you've got that player through the middle that has to occupy central defenders and allow those players behind to play, I just don't see it. There is no physicality. There is no pace. And I look at it and Forrest looked like a nice team to play against. That if you were a centre-back and you walked off that pitch, I think you'd think, I quite enjoyed that. Now, there was a bit of talk in the summer, and it was only speculation about the striker at Blackpool, Yates. Now, one thing you get with him is when you walk off the off the pitch, you know you've had a game. Yeah, Make sure you know you've had a game. You know, you, you played for a manager many, many moons ago, and you had to make sure that the centre-back that you're up against had had a game. Otherwise, you've got to deal with him. And I look at the two forwards that, that, that Forrest have in Graben and Taylor said it for a long time. If you put the two of them together, you'd probably get the number nine that you need. But they've both got different skill sets. But playing in the system that he's played in the main this season, I just don't see how those individuals give the team what they need to play that way. And that would be a concern. Do you think performative effort is a thing, Gaz, in the sense of you can close down a goalie and slide and try and block a kick and the crowd will love it? And then when you've got a 50-50 with the defender, you can end up on the ground appealing to the ref 30 times and you've not really done your job, have you? Or am I being harsh on Taylor there? I mean, he, he had the ball lumped up to him 50 times and he didn't win any of them. What's the level of expectation in a situation like that as a striker? Now, before, Gaz, before Gaz comes in on that, let, let's just put the caveat in here. that If the, the Lyle Taylor that we saw play at Charlton was playing in that Forest team, we'd be having a different conversation. Something yeah. different about Lyle Taylor in a Forest shirt than it ever was in a Charlton shirt. And, and child, if you speak to a Charlton supporter about him, they can't understand how he's not ripping it up. And I think that was the expectation. And let's also not forget that the summer that Forrest got Taylor, he was the jewel in the crown for everybody in the division. And I think Brentford ended up with Ivan Tony because Forrest ended up with Lyle Taylor. Now, at that stage, it looked like the perfect fit, the perfect signing. But something's happened to him. I don't so know is, that, is that a tactical thing? Is that the manager not utilising him? Right? He looked, I mean, I, I only do the eye test, guys. I'm not a football manager. I'm a football supporter with a microphone. But he looks entirely different. He used to be an absolute nightmare for centre-backs. He could occupy two. I remember when he came the season, he was with Charlton. And they were looking dead and buried. But he was the best player on the pitch by a mile. And anybody in the ground that night would have taken him, wouldn't they? But you look at him now, and he looks a pale shadow of that individual. Lovely fella accountable, you know, stand-up guy, really, you know, really good person to have around the place, but he just looks a different footballer. I, I, and I, I don't know why that would be. Is it because of systems or what, what he's asked to do in, in the Forest shirt? Because he, what he does, he tries his what's-its off every yep. game. He's, he doesn't shirk that. You cannot fault the effort. 
But I think sometimes he's nullified by his honesty to come a little bit deeper and try and get involved when he's not getting a kick. Because then he's out of position to where you really want him to be, where he's hurting players. And probably at Charlton, he was told, right, don't come do that. You know, you just stay there. We'll get support to you. We'll feed you. You know, we've got players who can do it and just score me goals. But because Forrest have been a very defensive-minded team and they sit back a little bit, especially when the, they take the lead, then you all get dragged backwards and that includes a striker. And then when it, you get the ball and try and, and get on the front foot, you've got a lot of yards to make up and it's not always that easy. I've said before that that time I played in the, in the European Cup final up front by myself. It was the hardest game of football I've ever had. It's not easy. And you, you're beholden to players around you. Luckily, you know, I had players around me who, who supported me unbelievably well. But I, I'll, I'll say again at the moment, yesterday, I just think it just showed how naive we can be at times because Flint and Morrison, as we've said, six foot five, the pair of them, love heading it, would hate players who get around the feet, quick players who go in the channels, drag them out of position. We didn't do that. We just smashed the ball up towards Graben and, and Taylor. And they just headed it for fun. And we didn't pick the second balls up. They won the second balls. If you're going to do that, you have to win a fair percentage of your second balls. We didn't do that. And when the ball comes in our box, every time it went in our box yesterday, I, I just tried to close my eyes because I thought, yeah, here we go again. You know, Worrell and um, McKenna, decent in the air. But when they're up against four or five players who, you know, are very, very good in the air, it, it's, it's very difficult. And you tend to switch off. You tend to think, oh, here we go again. I was astounded how many throw-ins we gave away yesterday when we could have done better in areas where they could just launch it into our box. Mm. You know, think about it. What ball, are their strengths? You? Pardon? You've got to try and keep the ball, haven't you? You've got to try and be yeah, brave just, and move up the pitch. Don't just kick it out because they'll just throw it straight back in your box and put you under pressure again. So there was a lot, again, not particularly good yesterday, but... I, I can't understand why we have got two strikers who just won't attempt to head the ball. They won't, pure and simple. Lewis Graben, six foot one, won't head the ball. You you go through any stats, I don't know, and, and see how many times he heads the ball. He just doesn't do it. And Taylor's the same. He'll back in. I can remember the defender going over him yesterday and he gave the foul away. You know, he'll back in and try and do that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's OK, but... Not every time. You've got to try and back in. You've got to try and hold them off. You've got to try and stand on the defender's feet. That's what I used to do. I was only six foot, but I could jump. And I wanted to jump. I wanted to head the ball. And that's the difference. I don't think they want to head the ball. And that annoys me because that's their, that's their job. I was going to swear there for a minute. I just reined it in a little bit. Because that's your job. Pure and simple. That's part of being a striker. Mm. You know, you look, you look at Luis Suarez, you can say what you like about him, but he could head a ball. You look at Kevin Keegan, how tall he was. My goodness, how good was he in the air? You know, it, it's not an excuse that you can't head the ball because you, you may be only six foot one. You can, you can affect things by being cute with defenders, you know, just feeling before, you know, the ball comes towards you. So he's off balance. Just not foul him, just make him off balance. So it gives you a yard to get the ball at your feet, turned, and then you're on the offensive. But we don't. there's no nous there. It's just non-existent. And that is, for me, as an ex-striker, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to get any easier. Nobody comes to the ball either. No, nobody comes to the I always used to go to the ball. I talked with John Robertson all the time. And I was always there for him, as was Tony, you know, as was Trevor. Trevor was good at going the other way because he had more pace than me and Tony. But we always made ourselves available. And you don't see that either. So the man on the ball then has a problem. What does he do with it? You know, does he try and play play through and then you get dispossessed, then you're on the back foot again? Strikers have got a, a very important role to play and it, it's not just one facet of being a striker. You need the whole lot. And I don't think our two strikers have got that at the moment. And it gets no easier on Wednesday because you've got Middlesbrough who are, are very similar, aren't they, as well, Fletch? You, you, you think about the the Cardiff team was put together essentially in the main by Neil Warnock, hence why they do what Gary's said and they do it really well. And Middlesbrough will come and do exactly the same on Wednesday. Whatever shortcomings were there on Saturday or Sunday, rather, if Forrest do the same thing against Middlesbrough, 
they'll run into the same brick walls because you know that Middlesbrough will fundamentally do what is necessary to win a championship match because that's what their manager does. It might not always be the greatest thing to watch and it, 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 you know, it might come with a few caveats, but he knows how to set a team up round pegs and round holes and away you go. You see, I, I think there's a big problem here. There's a real global issue here and that is that the way that Chris wants to play He's never going to get the crowd on side unless you win. Now, that sounds a bit daft that you say, well, managers have got to win. They have. But if they're not winning, but they're playing in a certain way, there'll at least be the connection with the crowd. And I don't think there's ever been a connection at all between the Forest supporters and the manager. Now, the board's issue on the back of that is how many managers do you chop and change before you decide to stick with one? Because at some stage, you've got to stick with somebody. Now, they, they've had a lot of managers. They've had a lot of different types of managers. They've had a few constants in the dressing room. But whatever they do, they can't get the right combination of player, manager, and recruitment. So you've got various strands that are all disjointed. It's what I say when I say it doesn't feel joined up. But again, you know, there is no connection with Chris and the crowd. So there's a lot of impatience, and I understand that. You know, I think certain clubs have a certain feeling that they should be playing a certain way. And I think you can go too far sometimes. People talk about the West Ham way. Well, you know, that's fine. But, you know, West Ham are going to play a certain brand of football. But let's 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 not think they've still got the World Cup winners from 1966. I think that can go a little bit too far. But Forrest has a, a tradition and a history of playing a certain way. And even under the previous manager, you know, when he played a, a defensive counter-attacking way, when they did counter-attack, they were exhilarating at times. There were some special performances at home with a team that would, would happily sit back. But when they went, they went. You know, you think about Leeds at home, it was an edgy seat stuff. So there was the connection with the fans and he could play a defensive way because he got that balance right that when they did attack, they attacked with a, a real bit of flair and, and speed and, and it was good to watch. So I get that. I think the way Chris plays as well, it's going to be hard for that momentum to necessarily change because they are going to try and win games, as Gary said, by the odd goal. And Chris made the quote yesterday, we're losing games by the odd goal. The way that Forest play under Chris, they're only going to win games by the odd goal, aren't they? They're not an expansive, open, attacking team that when it all falls into place, they're going to go and stick teams away. That's not the way they're built. So to actually get results and momentum from this point on is going to be hard. It's 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 a real it's a real uphill battle now, and I can't really remember Gaz too many periods where there were so many questions, so many different things that are going to be right. I mean, you we could sit here and do a podcast for a couple of hours on the recruitment. We could sit and do a podcast for a couple of hours on the team. We could do an hour on the centre forward position alone. We could do numerous podcasts on the manager and what they might do there there's so many things it's like a jigsaw puzzle where you've put it together you've opened the box and you've tipped it on the floor all the pieces have come out and now you're trying to put it together again i didn't think they'd be in this situation with a manager as experienced as chris now whether he's not allowed to do what he's been allowed to do before because of the structure i don't know i'm not in there i don't know i do know though that there are a lot of moving parts to how the club runs behind the scenes. There's a lot of moving parts. And I think when you're winning, you can probably get away with it. But when you're losing, I think it makes the problem more difficult. And I, I don't know what the role of the, of the new guy is, Dane Murphy. I, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, you know, we saw Barnsley what they did last season. I saw Barnsley the season before as well, and they were different years. So I, I, I don't know whether the sample size is big enough to say that with confidence he's going to come in and put it right whether his methods will be the way that pulls it all together. I don't know. Nobody knows. And again, you know, this is this is a situation where there's a tremendous amount of willingness in there to do the right thing. You know, from, from Nick Randall down, there's a lot of people in there trying to do the right thing. But I just wonder whether it's actually set up for it to be able to work properly. Because it... I don't think at this stage it should be as disjointed as it is, Gaz. And this is just me looking from the outside. I don't know, but I, it just looks that way. Yeah, and I, I, we'll go back to a point you made when you, you're looking for targets. I think targets should have been looked at during last season because last season wasn't a, a particularly good season again for us. So two, three months before the end of the season, just have a look at targets. 
up front and, and then you think, right, OK, we'll go for the, him, him or him. We can't get him, we'll take him. But we got nothing. Like you said, goalkeeper. Then the guy who's scored nine goals in 116 games, the boy from West Ham. You know, there's nothing there to excite the fans in, in terms of signings. And I always say, I've said it on so many occasions, you've got to look at the way the previous teams got promoted. Yeah. What did they do to get promoted? What did they have in their team that got them promoted? And I don't think any of our managers have done that. I think they think, well, I'm going to do it my way, which is fine. But you can look at the way other people do it and say, OK, those three teams went up. What did they have that we haven't? And I don't think they take that into consideration. And I think it's vital you do that. And you'll look at the teams and say, well, why did they go down? Oh, they did it because that, that and that. They didn't score enough goals. They haven't got enough decent strikers. It's the same at both ends of the table. Look why success happens and look why failure happens. But we don't seem to take that on board. And, you know, you look at West Brom, Leeds, the teams that the physicality and the, the pace, everything about them just looks better than we've looked over the last few years. You know, physically, we look... I don't know. It's like a non-league team, maybe. And that, that, that might be an insult to a non-league team. We just don't look like a strong football team with strong players in like the, the other teams I've just said who have gone up like Fulham had Mitrovic. I mean, talking about uh, Fulham, they got beat by Blackpool at the weekend. Mm. And this is Blackpool who got promoted. They beat Fulham. We can't beat anybody at the moment. Well, what I would say about that, they've got Neil Critchley in charge. He's a fresh... He's got fresh methods. He's well connected. Um, he can improve a player. He can improve a player. He's got his connections to Liverpool. And we know how important the loan market is to any club in the Championship, whether you're a big championship. Well, we've got Chris Hughes, Fletch. You know, surely that's... Yeah. That's and, 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 you know, yeah. And that was exactly the point I was going to make, guys, that I... Th this, again, is where it, it makes me question how, how it works. Because you would think that Chris been around the Premier League for that long and he's a nice fella Chris if you're ever in Chris's company you come away and you like him you know and, and I, I would say that Chris is a likeable guy and you would think that there would be managers around the country that would want to help him that he'd have a relationship where he could he could pick the phone up and get a player this makes me question how much say does he have yeah. you know it, let, let's play devil's advocate if, if all these players that are being signed and they're Chris Hutton signings and they're not making a blind bit of difference that makes whatever decision about his future is at any stage easy to make because he's had carte blanche, he's signed the players, he then wins or loses by his decisions, his, his judgment. Fine. That's how it's always worked. But if you work at a club where recruitment's handled by somebody else and you don't get a great deal of say in that and you're given players and they then don't fit the way that you want to play, then if you're a manager, you can feel hard done to because yeah. then you're sitting there going, but I don't want these. Like, this agree. is my, totally me, agree. my way. I don't want these players. I want that player, that player. But you won't give them me. You're giving me these. So this is where the problem comes. And that, that's why it looks so disjointed, I think. Because I would have expected Chris to come in and go, right, let's get through the contacts book. I need this. I need this. I need this. Right. They can help me. Right. Bring them in. Off we go. But we're, we're, the only player that you think, well, two, the only two players that look like those kind of signings are Bong, who we had at Brighton, and Glenn Murray, who he's known for donkey's years. But the rest of them, I don't know. But but we don't know how that structure works, do we? So it's difficult to make a a, a judgment that you think is going to be accurate because you just don't know. Do we need clarity from the you know the club maybe that who is in charge of the signings? Because Fletch, when was the last time you were excited by a signing for Nottingham Forest? Exactly. I thought this summer they would go and sign it. I, I thought they'd work from the centre forward position down. And I, I said this on a previous podcast. I didn't think they'd sign anybody until they got the number nine they needed. And I think I thought they'd work off that because it was it was clear to everybody that they've got to get a forward. Now that might cost a few, uh, you know a fee, and it might cost a significant fee. But if you if you're serious about wanting to get promoted, you have to pay that money. There's no there's no cheap way of doing it. Well, let's go back to uh, Agbon Lahore, not Agbon Lahore, um, Antonio and uh, Asomba Longa. You yeah. know, they, they they gambled on those two with money and it paid off both really? times with, with those players. You get and your money back. It's kind of right when you get the money back if you have to press reset anyway. Yeah, exactly. They got, they got more money for Antonio and Asomba Longa than they paid. 
So, you know, it's good business sense as well. You, you give it a go. And if you if you blow the whole thing up again and, and bring a new manager and you, you, you've you got saleable assets. So mm -hmm. they were talking about the, the manager with the uh, the best win ratio. And that was Martin O'Neill, who they sacked according, you know, apparently um, it was player power. You know, so you hear players didn't like his methods of training or whatever. Right. Listen, and, they, and they get rid of guys, them because of that. Guys, you've been a player. If 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 you're firing managers with a team that plays like that because they don't like the manager, I think you got to start looking at the players, don't you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, let, let's be honest here. If 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 managers are getting fired based on the fact that players don't like them, and then you're watching the players play like that, you're back in the wrong horse. Yeah. And that's only me speaking as a football supporter. That I'm not in that. I don't know. Never managed a team in my life, and I never will. But. If you're backing players time and time again and you're getting rid of managers because, and then they perform like that, then you've got to look closer to home. Yeah, without that, doubt. If you, look at, if, if you look at Forest now in this window, they've reshaped the recruitment team and I think they, they are Murphy signings, these players. Let's say they are Murphy signings because they bought in this new recruitment team and Chris Hewton hasn't worked under that model and it doesn't necessarily favour him. He's spoken about... You know, the club have said this is the way we're going, you know, younger, lower average wage, different way of doing it, high resale value, which is fine. And I can think, you know, you can make a good case for it. But then aren't you at the point where it's actually like a marriage where you're just staying together for the kids? You know, Hewton yeah. doesn't fit what Forrest well, won. If you go down that route, I think it's very, very difficult to, to bring a man in and say, right, you're now going to run the club, but you've got to work with this manager. I don't. I don't. I think you, if you if you if you're going to do that, you've got to press reset, and that's not any kind of criticism of Chris. Whoever the manager is, unless the new guy is completely, and I mean completely, on board with that appointment and that individual, you may as well do both at the same time, because you're eventually going to be at cross purposes, aren't you? And when you look at Ishmael, who's gone to West Brom, who was the manager of Barnsley last year. His values and methods are very, very different to Chris Hewton's. The way they played and what he does. You think about how much running Gary Barnsley did last year. And, and I think one of his battles at West Brom, Ishmael, this year is going to get one or two of them running a lot more because they were a very energetic, physical team, weren't they, Barnsley? They did, covered a lot of ground. They were sharp. There was a lot of things there. That would, that would make me question... If you gave Dane Murphy a blank piece of paper and said, right, write down your 10 managers that you'd like to have, be interested to know how high Chris would be on that list, just based on Chris's style of management and the way he's always done it. Mm -hmm. I said before, the, the game's evolving, Fletcher, all the time, isn't it? It, it never seems to stand still. No. And methods that you know worked maybe three, four years ago aren't necessarily working now because t everything is done so professionally now. Every team look at every little facet of the opposition. They pick it apart and they, they'll they go for the, the uh, weaknesses in your team every time. Yeah, they'll, they'll appreciate the strengths, but they'll look at the weaknesses and they'll try and exploit that. That's what happens now at every level. It's not just Premier League, Championship. You go down to League Two, they do exactly the same. They'll get the players watching opposition, what happened in the previous game, what you can do better. And... That, that's how the game has evolved and that makes it difficult for everybody. But I don't think a manager or a coach can not have carte blanche on what he wants, who he wants. You, you can't have the two going against each other because it just doesn't work. The clash will be unbelievable between chief exec who is bringing players in, if that's the case, and the manager who wants to bring his players in to suit his system, his way of playing, and he's not being allowed to. It just doesn't work. It won't work. And you just worry that the, the collision is going to come at some point and who knows what the you know the outcome will be. If, if you're going to have layers to management in any business, and, and in particular football, everybody's got to be on the same page. Everybody has to want the same thing. Everybody has to believe in the same method. If there's any dispute, it just won't work because recruitment are going to bring players that, that don't fit manager's method. Manager's going to coach players in a way that doesn't agree with recruitment method. And it, it, it's just a, a head-banging exercise where the, 
people are going to completely be at loggerheads. And uh, you think about what they've done at Manchester United. They've gone and, you know, quietly behind the scenes, restructured what they've done in terms of the way their technical side works alongside the managerial side. Everything's been done with an eye on Ole Gunnar Solskjaer being the manager. They've decided that that is what they're going to do. They want him. He's right. So they've got to put all those people in place to work alongside him. So they're trying to move now as a, a much more choreographed unit than they have in the past. So Darren Fletcher came in. They took the fella from Everton and put him into a situation. But it's all geared around. These people are all joined up together. Paratici at Tottenham. They looked at other managers but I think Daniel Levy was having a fair influence on that. Paratici in the end wanted Nuno Espirito Santo, hence why he's in there. So now you've got technical director with a manager that he wants, and they you would expect now to see football through the same eyes. And that's the important thing, isn't it? If you're going to go and recruit for a manager, if you don't watch the game through his eyes, how can you get the right players consistently? Because you mm. might see something in an individual that he doesn't, or you might see something he doesn't want, and that might be the reason why you make that sign-in. It's why Clough and Taylor work so well together, because Peter knew what Brian wanted. So he just used to give, bring it. He was a They hardly got any wrong. Yeah, because they knew intuitively what both of them wanted for the team to be right. And recruitment can be the most difficult thing in football. It can also be the easiest thing in football, but it's certainly in modern football the most important thing. The recruitment's more important than the manager, really, because you could be a great manager, but if you recruit badly, you're not winning. And mm. And... Recruitment in football now is key. And, and, and unless they sit there and, and they watch games together and they're seeing the same thing and they're wanting the same strengths, and they, they, it's difficult. It's difficult. Otherwise, you've got one person doing one thing and one person, and you get this disjointed setup. And this is, this is not just a Forest thing. This is a football thing. So how much longer can you leave it as it is? Because Forest have got one point from six games and they're on, you know, a couple more bad results and they're going to need playoff form to stay up. So, I mean, how much longer before you pull the trigger, Fletch? You've got to, you, the, 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 only they will know what the answer to that is. And, and they've got to decide as a, as a board, as an ownership, how many times they want to change the manager because it happens a lot. At some point, you've got to have a manager that you stick with through thick and thin. And you might have to take steps backwards before you take steps forward. If you're not going to do that, then you can make the change at any stage, can't you? Um, but again, the question would be, I'd throw a question back at both of you. If you did change Chris, what would you do? Because the obvious <clears throat> name on everybody's lips is Chris Wilder. Because no, of no. feel United. I'm led to believe there's been no conversation with Chris Wilder. So Chris Wilder at the minute doesn't seem to be on, a, on, on the radar. What if the club decided, and I'm only speculating here because I don't know, but what if the club decided, look, we're going to make a managerial change. We've tried Chris Uton. We're going to go back to a European coach now. We're going to try that again. How long before the supporters would say, I don't like that either? And would that necessarily work? You see, it's difficult. It's not as if you'd go, if we make this change, this is guaranteed to, to, to turn it. Because mm. Chris is supposed to be that fella. Let's let's rewind. You know, I'm, I'm big enough to stick my hand up and say, I've called this wrong. I thought he'd be more successful than he is. But I didn't hear too many people when he got the job saying, oh, that's a terrible appointment. That's That's awful. Most people said this is exactly the fellow that they need and they can stick with him now over a, a few years, build something, build the club, get it where it wants to be and keep it there. Fantastic. In a short space of time, that's changed. But it's what you, what, what, whose decision would it be? Who would you go and get? What would you do? Is yeah. it going to make any difference? Would it make it worse? Supporters might be screaming at the podcast, well, you've got to do something, which is I, I agree with. I get that. Fine. I take it. But I just don't think there's a an exact science when it comes to this. The biggest concern I'd have if I was Chris is I have no connection to the fan base. And I think if you're going to go through tough times, you at least have to all be together and you've got to believe in the fellow that's, that's the manager. And if the A block aren't with you and the trend end aren't with you and they're asking you, it's difficult. It's difficult. So... Yeah. <sighs> I've not really answered it, but there are a lot of layers 
yeah. to the not just as straightforward sack him or not. It's not as easy as that. How many times mm. have we been here before, though? That that's yeah. the you know disappointing thing. It never goes right, Gaz. When they make the decision, so it's, it never goes right. That's what no. we've never been in a situation where you think, well, when we did it, then it never it's never been right. So, mm. but what I think you need, John Terry, I think you... John Terry um, Eddie Howe. These names are all being mentioned as well, but you know, Chris is still in the job at the moment. He's never managed a club in his life, and he's going to give him the club one point, a drift at the bottom of the table. And by the way, you know, with the baggage that he brings, so the scrutiny and the the, the spotlight shining on him is going to be ginormous. When you think about the backstory of John Terry, do you really want to bring that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you know, my my, my view would be that the reason he's not managing now is that chairman have reservations about him for whatever reason. And and if if you think if, if people are thinking John Terry at this stage, I mean that's that's catching lightning in a bottle from a managerial sense because nobody knows whether he can manage or not. I, I think what you need is what you said earlier, Fletch. If you make the change, you need someone who shares Dane Murphy's vision if he's running right. the club. Exactly. And if that's to me uh, if that's decision. a head coach and not a manager, that's fine. Yeah. But it's got to be someone who can play a football style of football that the fans are going to buy into because I think they're sick of conservative football going back a long time. And it needs to be someone who's going to give a identity of play, a pattern of play, and someone who's going to improve young players. Yeah. Once, you've that's what the, once you've made the decision, and Gaz will tell you this, once you if you if you run any business and you make the decision that this is the, the person that's going to lead it. Everything has to work off that person. Yeah, and, and that's the, the, the coaching staff, the recruitment. Otherwise, you shouldn't appoint. You shouldn't have appointed him. Mm. So, if they're convinced that Dave Murphy's got the the philosophy and the knowledge and the know how and whatever he needs to lead it from the top, then the ownership need to turn around and say, right, you just make all the decisions then, and you get the manager, the one you want, you organise the recruitment staff the way you want it, and we're going to live or die by what you do. And, and mm. if they don't. That way, they've got the wrong bloke running it. So, you know, yeah, I've mentioned before. I like what I see at Luton as well. You know, the way they go about what they do. You know, with a, again a team with another low budget. You know, they've got Paul Hart in there, Chris Cohen, who we all know. Uh, they've got a, you know, an excellent manager, and that, that's I think everybody Forest fan wise looks at the other teams and what they're doing. The teams that maybe should be struggling and not us, and they see them in the top half of the table, thinking, well. Hold on a minute. What's going on here? You know they've got three. You know the lowest budgets in the league, and look how well they're doing. And and that just affects the fan base for me. You're right, Fletch. If they if they brought this guy in, the chief exec, then he has to have carte blanche on what he has to do, and that that might not bode well for Chris. Um, you no, know, but that's, that's life, guys, isn't it? it that's, is. and, and by the way, they took that long in appointing him. They must have gone through this process with a fine tooth comb to make sure that he was the one because this wasn't a an overnight thing. This went on. This this was a process that started at the end of last season, and it took the whole of the summer before they finally went right. This is it. So they must know enough about him to be confident that he's the right person. And you, you know, as as an outsider, we'd have to trust in that process, wouldn't we? And if that's the case, he's then got to lead that. And, and and if they don't do it that way, then it's it's totally messed up. Yeah, these next few weeks will be rather interesting. Yeah, true. And um, one last he topic. Might sat, he might be sat there, Matt, believing in Chris. He might be, but then they need to come out and say that then. And if he is, fair, fair enough. But do you have to come out and say it if you believe yes. in the manager? Yes, the person that the fans need to hear from now is the chief exec. Because mm. he should be making the decision. So the next time the Evening Post do a big sit-down or Radio Nottingham do a big sit-down, all these questions shouldn't be directed at Chris or whoever the player is that day who's been put up. This is a Dane Murphy. Let's let's find out what you think then. Tell the fans, because they're, they're still going, by the way. The people I feel sorry for in all this are the fans because they're there and they always have been and they always will be and they deserve better, right? Explain to them what's happening. Because what I find with Forest supporters, lots of which are my friends, and I've, I've worked in the city and I've covered the club, they love honesty. 
And if you give him honesty, they'll be fine. I think back to the night when Joe Kinnear told his guys on the phone in that he was going to sign Dennis Bergkamp so they could sell season tickets. He could have packed his stuff that night and driven away. And nobody would have batted an eyelid because everybody knew he was telling lies. And you can't tell lies to football supporters, particularly Forest fans, because they're, they're, too, they're too savvy to, 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 to have the wool pulled over their eyes. Dane Murphy needs to sit, come out, sit down and explain what the situation is because he's the man who should have the answers. This is not a Nick Randall thing. This is not a Johnny Owen thing. This is not a, 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 a Maranakis thing. This, 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 is, this is the guy now that's running the football club. And I think the only person that should be providing the answers, the clarity, the blueprint, is him. And if, he, if he's behind Chris, he should come out this morning or tomorrow, whatever it is, and say, he's my manager – if I was starting a managerial search now, I'd pick him. And he's not going anywhere because we're going to get this right. If mm. he's not, then, it, then they've got to do what they've got to do. But there's no point delaying it. He knows now whether he's, whether he's the manager that he believes in. He knows now. And, and if he is, crack on. Just tell everybody and be honest. Then mm. the fans have got the option of coming or not. And if they don't want to go because they don't like the football, you've not got to go. But at least you're being honest with the people that stick their hand in the pocket in difficult times at the minute. Mm. The Be problem for me is we all remember League One and how difficult it was to get yes. out of that, that particular league. Look, I mean, yes. look at Sunderland. They still can't get out. It's not still easy. Look at Ipswich, Gaz, this year. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And, you know, it was a battle for Forrest to get back into the championship. And, you know, the hope of, you know, Maranakis, like I say, you can't fault him because of... He's invested loads in this football club. The, the Olympiacos connection always baffles me a little bit because, you know, players to and fro between that. that I don't think that helps at times. But don't give the owners stick. Without him, we would have been in a much... No club, guys. Worse... There'd be no club now. Without, no. He's, he's putting in millions of pounds of his own money every year just to stop it from folding. So don't ever look at the chap at the top and go, it's on him. Because it's not. Because without him... You'd need somebody else with his money to put their hand in the pocket. Is that one word again, Fletch? Recruitment. Yeah. Whether recruiting a manager, recruiting players. I don't think it's been particularly good. No. And I'm sure you'll agree. I do. Mm. I do. Um, but, but this is the point now no. where we can sit. We could sit here till tomorrow morning. Only person that has the answer is the man that's now sat in the big chair, and he knows. And I, and I think it's with the club in the circumstances that it's in, I think it's time for him to come out and, and outline what he wants, what he thinks, what he sees, and give the fan base some belief that they can rely on him. Don't be, don't be invisible. If that's your yeah. style, that's great. But there's a time and a place to actually be visible. And it's mm. now. It's in a time of crisis. Yeah, don't be on the front seat of the open top bus when they get promotion. Aren't I good? Do it now. Come and speak mm. to the supporters now. Explain what the situation is. Give a bit of clarity. Let people know. And then let the fans make the mind up. Mm. They'll respect you a lot more for it. And they'll thank yeah. you for it. Yeah. They deserve it. Um, I think he's getting married this week, so he better do it next week when he gets back. <laughs> well, actually, perhaps he should have done it last week then. Well, yeah. With all due respect at the moment, by the way, you know, I'm delighted for him that he's getting married. But the situation that club room at the minute, it, it's... It's a oh, time yeah. to focus this. This is this is great. But, you know, all joking aside, next week might be a defeat to Middlesbrough in midweek and another one next week. And the gap then could be double what it is now. Mm. Mm. Everything's fine and dandy until you start to think, wow, now we've got to win four to get out. This is your problem. Because you're looking at that team at the minute. What, what, what have they got? How many games have they got left? 38, something like that. Mm. How many are they going to win legitimately? This Forest team. How many are they going to win legitimately? Because they're not going to win all of them. Nobody. No. And and they're not going to win fifty percent of them. Because if they did, they'd probably get promoted. So they're perhaps going to win 10, 12? Win thirty six points plus ten draws. That's forty six right. points. That's a bit right. broken. So every game now, even this early, that's difficult because you're thinking. I always makes me laugh when we get to the end of the Premier League season. And everybody's sitting there thinking, oh, you know, they've got six games left. If they win four, they'll stay up. And then you look at the wins column, and they won two all year. So you think, well, are they going to win four then? Because they've only just won two 
They've won two yeah. out of 40 odd. Now they're going to win four out of six. It's just, just mm. doesn't happen, does it? So, that's what I said, five points out of the last 36. I mean, right. that's unacceptable. You know? Right. So the reality is that this is going to be an uphill battle, whoever the manager is, because they're just not going to win lots of games because it, it, they haven't. Mm. So every game that passes where they lose or draw makes it more difficult. So it's critical now. People go, it's early in the season. It is. But you're only going to win a finite number of football matches. And this team has showed you how hard it finds to win those games. So that, any kind of gap, it's tough. And it, the one thing Forrest can't do is get relegated. They've got to stay up. Well, mm. if they get relegated, what does the owner then do? That, that's right. a frightening thing. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And you, you, you're looking at it now thinking, oh, got to win a few games. Mm. So when you look at clubs, the situation that Derby are in, there's six points on the board. For everything that's that's happened there, and all the you know people laughing at him, and they might get points off. It might be might be a moot point, but he's got six points on the board, and he didn't have a team two weeks before the season. But he's managed to get six. Is it six, five, or six? Six, yeah. I think. Six, I think. Yeah. Points on the board. Forrest has sat there with one, and they've had no issues like he's had. Mm. So, mm. you know, let let's kind of put it into perspective. And I mentioned Birmingham at the start. You know, Birmingham stayed up by the skin of the teeth. And they've been a, a horror story for years now with, with bad ownership and mismanagement and crazy things going on, situations that you wouldn't wish on a club. But now they've got progress. They're top half of the league. Mm. But all these teams shouldn't be – they shouldn't be holding a candle to Forrest in the situation that, that they're in. Mm. Forrest is sailing serenely on compared to some clubs in the championship and falling way short. And – it's 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 worrying. It really is. One last point I want to finish on to give the club some credit and massively to the fans. Um, the kind of the minutes applause for Dylan Rich, the young lad who lost his life, you know, a cardiac arrest on the pitch playing the FA Youth Cup um, at the age of seventeen. Just a horrible situation. So uh, fair play to the fans and the club. I thought putting on a good celebration. I don't have any time. doubt, and Gary would tell you the same. There was no doubt. That that young man was going to be shown the respect and given the the appreciation that day that he and his family deserved. I'd never yeah. had any doubt. I knew that the club would do it right, and I knew the fans would be perfect. And by the way, full credit to the England team as well who held the shirt up for Dylan as well before the match in midweek as well. Which you know, at times like this, the family are, are so broken and so devastated that little tiny things that people can do at a stage like this will just help them along that journey. So well done to. It affects us all. It affects us all in football. You know, we talk about the football family. That's what it's all about at any level. You know, the pyramid level. It, it, it's what you know what counts. That's where I came through from. That sort of football, not non-league, and you know, you do it because you love it. And you know, when it happened, Viv Anderson uh, texted me straight away saying, you know, oh, how how sad. And he went right through, you know, what was going on with the you know his team, and it, it does affect you. You know, even you know us at our age, it does affect you because you know these football teams. You've, you've played against these football teams coming through as a kid and it's it's awful, you know, when it when it happens at that that you know at that age. It's just you know how can you lose a child at that age? It's horrible. Mm, true, true. I know I know you I know you said you know kind of finish off and, and, and give the club a bit of credit, etc. I, I, I and I would say and I you know I, I hope the supporters hear it. And I think they know it. There are a lot of good people down there. And they are as determined to try and get this club into the, the Premier League and keep it there. They want for the club what the fans want for the club. It's not as if they've got people in there that aren't really, really good people who want to get it right. Uh, and nobody's doing it in there to try and be obstructive or... It saddens me when I go because I see the looks on people's faces at full time when they've lost and it hurts. Right. Um, we'll leave it there. Plenty to go out and plenty to muse on. And obviously we'll do it all again on Thursday after whatever happens against Middlesbrough. But we do hope Forest win and start to turn this mess around. Uh, Gary, thank you very much as ever. Pleasure. And Fletch, thank you as ever. Good to talk to you, mate. And we shall catch everyone. Thank you for listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. 
We'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for listening. Yeah.